So I woke up uncharacteristically early this morning. Hi, I'm Sal from Comic Pop, YouTube.com slash Comic Pop, and YouTube.com slash Comic Pop Returns. Who knows what this is going to be, but good morning. Hope you're doing well. So I got up early this morning, and it got me on this whole tear to start this new idea. Who knows where it's going to go? Co-host, guests, you never know. It's a brand new thing. It may never go past the first episode. But let me finish my anecdote here. So I got up early this morning, and I went out to my comic shop because I was like, ooh, my local comic book store, the localist comic book store, opens the earliest, which is fantastic. So I zipped over there because I wanted to pick up a copy of Image number 7. When I say Image, I mean because apparently for the last six issues, there's been a periodical published by Image Comics that collects a bunch of stories, and it's called Image with an exclamation point. So you have to read it like it's like an exclamation, like, oh, Image, Image, as opposed to just Image no punctuation whatsoever. But I wanted to pick that up because it was the latest entry in the Witches Saga from Scott Snyder and Jock, and my wife Tiffany is a huge Witches fan, or at least she had been. I think that they had published some kind of sequel, I think they called it Bad Egg, and I don't remember what her opinion of it was, but I'm sure it was pretty high. So I went over there to pick up Image, Number seven, among other things, because of course it was Wednesday, and it was new comic book day, and new books came out, and I had a pull list anyway, so you might as well go over there and pick it up. So I go there, and not only is it not on the shelf, but apparently the book wasn't flying off the shelves, and so they relegated it to special order only now. Like, the day that the book was relevant for people the one time people might actually want to pick up Image is the one time that they decided, you know what, we've been invested in this thing for at least six months, let's just move on. And so, not only did I not get a copy of Image number seven, but I don't think anybody is getting a copy of Image number seven from that comic shop. And it just got me thinking, because I don't know if they'd be kicking themselves if they even knew that they were printing a new witches in it, or not. Because you have to wonder whether people are excited for more witches now. And this is not going to be a focus about witches, about whether the witches brand from Scott Snyder and Jock from Image Comics that was published years ago is sustainable now, because I understand they are working on some kind of either series or movie. It's going to streaming, I think. But there is some kind of multimedia plan for Witches in the near future. Of course, I remember when Witches was first published. When the first issue dropped, they announced that it had been optioned for something. So I've been hearing about a Witches adaptation since Witches dropped. Since almost before Witches dropped. So take that with a grain of salt. But the reason why I'm bringing it up is because I'm wondering about the popularity and the enthusiasm surrounding comics. Because if you're a comic book retailer, you're probably in the speculator market in some fashion. You're probably hedging your bets and figuring out what's going to be popular, what's going to sell, what's going to catch, how many people are going to want this book post pre-orders. And I'm finding that the doors are not getting kicked in the way they had been, not even talking about the 90s. I'm talking about the last 10 years. People aren't kicking in the doors for the latest, hottest releases. The only reason I've found there is any rarity in a book is because orders were so low. Is because comic book retailers were hedging their bets and thinking, we probably shouldn't invest too much money in any of this. Which I think is significantly disheartening and also a little troublesome. Not just for comics, but also for some of us who commentate on comics, who may have launched a brand new show specifically dedicated to comics, and finding that the audience may be dwindling more and more aggressively than ever before. I significantly hope that's not true, not just selfishly, but also because the medium needs people to be excited about it. Now, normally I would tell you to leave a comment down below and tell me what you think, because I'd like to know whether you are feeling the same kind of, I don't know, absence, vacuum, burnout. There is a word for this. It's just a question of pinning down where everyone's going. Because I'll be honest with you, I'm seeing a decline in viewership just talking about comic books on the internet. And then you go to comic book shows and you see that there are 
fewer people and there are fewer comic retailers. New York Comic Con specifically. We just went to New York Comic Con a few weeks ago. And there were so few actual new comics available. I'll hit you with an example. Dan Mora, superstar artist. You've seen his work. He's on Batman Superman World's Finest. Great comic. You should be reading it. And also worked with Kieran Gillen on the 30-issue series Once in Future. Once in Future is a great series, and Tiffany loves it, and it's gorgeous looking, and it's written by Kieran Gillen, so you know it's well-written as well. I went through our archives to try and find the first issue of Once in Future, because I knew Dan Moore was going to be there, and wouldn't you know it, I couldn't find the damn thing. In fact, weirdly enough, I couldn't find the first 14 issues of Once in Future. I don't know where the hell they are, but I do have 16 through 30. That doesn't help anybody, and it's barely relevant to the conversation, but I digress. So, I go on the floor... And I think, okay, I'll just pick up a copy of Once in Future. Dan Mora has been billed as a guest for this show since they announced it. So it stands to reason that someone's going to have a copy of Once in Future number one. It wasn't a terribly popular series to begin with. So it's probably not even going to be breaking the bank to pick up a first issue. Maybe Dan Mora even has one at his booth. Well, I checked the booth. No. Not only is there no copy of Once in Future at his booth, there's no once in future anything at his booth. It's all Batman and Superman and DC. So, okay, that's disheartening. But I go up to the floor and I think, you know what I'll do? Boom Studios publishes Once in Future. I'll go to the Boom Studios booth and I'll pick up a copy there. I guarantee you, there's no way they're going to miss out on this opportunity. I go to the main floor. I look for the Boom Studios booth. There is no Boom Studios booth. Boom Studios, for like the first time in years isn't at New York Comic Con. They'd skipped out on New York Comic Con during the COVID year, but everybody skipped out on New York Comic Con during the COVID year. There were very few publishers at the show last year. This year, Marvel was there in a big way, but interestingly enough, that got me wondering, so I looked around, there's no image booth at New York Comic Con. There's no Dark Horse booth at New York Comic Con. The only comic book booths or Marvels, and IDW. That's right, DC didn't come either. I go to where DC is supposed to be, it's just a big empty room. It was just mind-bending. But also, I think, factors into what I was talking about before. These guys are hedging their bets. They're like, there is no demand for what we're making. Certainly not enough to invest in putting up dozens of people in hotels, Feeding them, transporting them, transporting materials, retransporting all the people and materials from the show back to where they came from. Especially DC, who's based out of Burbank now. So Boom lets me down. Okay, no Boom Studios. You know who will have it? There's a local comic book store in Wayne, New Jersey that has a huge booth at New York Comic Con every single year, Zap Comics. Not only do they have really fun discount trades, they also have an extensive library of recent books. Once in Future only dropped a couple of years ago. There's no way they won't have it. Guess who's not at the con? Zap Comics doesn't have a booth. Turns out that they were moved from their usual main floor spot by the organizers. And they went, you know what? It's not even worth it. The, this massive comic book retailer decides it's not worth going to one of the largest comic book shows in the country because they were moved to a less prime location. These are not petty people. These are business people who would put up with it if they felt it was cost effective, if they felt that it was worth their time, and they didn't. That is really concerning for a comic book store that has two locations and a massive warehouse and had, for at least 10 years, a massive showing at this show. I try all the different dealers. There were still half a dozen comic shops and comic book dealers that had individual issues. And none of them had any comics printed in the last five years. It was all Keys, Silver Age, Modern Age. There was very little actual independent comics, but more specifically, fewer comics that were printed in the last five to ten years. Which... I don't know. After the first two, I thought, this is getting ridiculous. But after the last one, I went, okay, that's just the new normal. These retailers are only working and catering for 
the collector's market. Th these are not comic book retailers at the show. These are comic book retailers who are doing something very different at this show. These guys are bringing inventory that is for hardcore collectors. And by the way, none of these booths were especially crowded. So, I don't know. It says to me that maybe there's something going on here. So to wrap up this anecdote, I do end up getting a copy of Once in the Future as a trade paperback from Midtown Comics. Midtown Comics has always had a presence at New York Comic Con, and they were obviously there. I passed their booth a number of times in my pursuit. I thought, well, I really don't want a trade paperback of this. I would rather have a single issue. And that's just a preference. But I finally end up going to the Midtown Comics booth, which is very crowded and has all these trades. And all the trades were printed in the last year and a half. And sure enough, one of them was Once in Future. So I grab that. I pay cover price. I go down to the basement where they keep all the artists. I give it to Tiffany. She gets it signed. Everybody's happy. But it's just really weird. It's telling to me that something is changing in the comics market. I mean, pretty recently, there was a pretty strong speculators market for indie books, that most indie books were at least optioned, if not considered, for some kind of streaming service. And there's still a huge amount, a glut, if you will, of streaming services that are desperate for content. So you'd think they haven't adapted everything, but here we are. So as you probably know, Thunderbolts is in full swing, not just because there's going to be a movie that stars a bunch of interchangeable characters, but also because there's a comic book series to tie in with it. It's on issue three, and it's written none other than by Jim Zub himself. We had Jim in the studio the other day, and he told us a funny story about the first time he'd ever been in New York. We're stuck in traffic. I'm in a cab, and it's terrible, terrible Manhattan traffic, and we're just sitting there, and the windows are rolled down because it's like summertime and it's really, really hot. And I look out the window, and basically there's a traffic cop about to give someone a ticket because they're parked, you know, illegally or whatever. Mm -hmm. And the person comes running over and is like arguing, please don't give me the ticket. No, look, I'm, I'm about to move. I can't afford a ticket. All of a sudden, this truck driver who's stuck in traffic rolls down his window and sticks his head out the window and goes, you give her that ticket. Don't let her talk her out of that. Don't, <laughs> don't let her talk herself out of that. She did the deed. says, I pay your salary and all this stuff. And the cop just looks over and goes, I give a ticket to who I want to give a ticket. You don't tell me who to give a ticket. And they start arguing. And the person's like, you shut up. She doesn't have to give me a ticket. And now they're all screaming at each other oh about God. whether or not the cops should give a ticket to the person illegally parked. And yeah. I'm just like, I wish I had the popcorn. Like, I'm like, this is so, <laughs> everyone's being so New York and they're right. screaming at each other and the accent and the like, the, yeah, you're going to uphold the law or what? And I'm just like, <laughs> oh my God, wow. I am having the best New York time. <laughs> Please don't drive. Like, just right. sit here so I can like drink this in. <laughs> You could find the entire conversation between myself and Jim over on the episode of Elseworlds Exchange called Massive Revamp for Marvel's Thunderbolts featuring Jim Zub. Moving right along, the biggest news I think that came out recently, this week anyway, was that James Gunn and Peter Safran were tapped to lead the film, TV, and animation division of DC Films. They're going to be the ones who report directly to David Zaslav, and more specifically, it looks like James Gunn is exclusively signed to DC for the next four years. So we have a little bit more leadership at DC Films, at least for the next four years. And so obviously that can change because apparently contracts are meaningless, but I would be shocked if they didn't re-up after the four years and continue this trend. I think it's a fantastic idea. James Gunn was at the top of a lot of people's lists for being the Kevin Feige of DC Films. I honestly don't think that there can be a Kevin Feige for DC Films because of how volatile it is over there and because of how tumultuous it is. I mean, we've heard the stories, apparently, that Kevin Feige threatened to leave and maybe even go to DC during his power struggle with Perlmutter. And it wasn't until they basically divorced Marvel Studios from Marvel Comics completely that Kevin Feige became entrenched enough to, like, never leave, to write his own ticket. I don't see that happening here with DC. I think that James Gunn is a creative force that has an eye for quality, or at the very least has an eye for creativity, and Peter Safran's more of like the money guy. 
Peter Safran also was involved in the Conjuring cinematic universe, which I've never seen a single one of those Conjuring movies, but I can say that it's successful. It's successful because it is smartly produced. You know, those movies never get beyond their budgets. They always cater to the audiences that come to see them, and they are successful enough to be able to make more of them. And that's got to be worth something. I also saw Safran's name associated with a couple of DC movies that I happen to really enjoy. The Suicide Squad, Shazam, Aquaman. So, again, we're in a good direction, I think. Or at the very least, DC Films is in a good direction. You know, We're hopefully going to be the beneficiaries of this decision in the form of great movies, or at the very least, entertaining movies. We're also in the wake of Black Adam coming out, which I think has nothing to do with any of this. Like, Black Adam feels like just a separate thing that is part of it. It feels actually kind of like Spider-Man in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, where it's like, Spider-Man can participate in the Marvel Universe, but he can't really directly influence it in any significant way. Like, he can play, but he can't push or alter the course of this universe. He can just participate in it. I think Black Adam's the same way, in terms of, like, they've got Sony pushing Spider-Man, so Marvel knows they can't do anything they want with that character. And over at DC, they've got Black Adam, who's associated with Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And I feel like Dwayne Johnson has plans, or at the very least desires for that character, that may not align with the DC plan. And so, as a result, I think you're going to see Black Adam part of it, but not necessarily influencing it in any significant way. But that's just a theory. I don't, I don't really know. Now, in the wake of the James Gunn news and the shakeup at DC, we're also seeing that apparently they're throwing away the HBO Green Lantern show and they're re-evaluating it, but refocusing it on Jon Stewart. This is according to The Hollywood Reporter on October 26th, but this is apparently another of the casualties or changes as a result of the tax write-offs and, acqu and acquisitions, uh, I cite Batgirl, and the questionable nature of Blue Beetle. I haven't heard anything about that movie, show, whatever, since the announcement of Batgirl, but I think I remember say, seeing someone mention that Blue Beetle was still on track. But, but that $120 million Green Lantern show is no more, or at the very least, it will be significantly changed to the point where I guess that was a Hamada project. I think pretty much anything that was a Hamada project will be shelved, thrown away, unceremoniously cut. It's interesting. This is a kind of move that happens when movie studios get new management. I remember Mark Steven Johnson, director of Ghost Rider, was apparently a really big Preacher fan. Loved the series from Garth Ennis and Steve Dillon and wanted to adapt it as a series. Now... It's interesting because I remember a time when Kevin Smith, director of Clerks 3, etc., wanted to make a Preacher movie, and I remember reading articles saying, like, View Askew Productions is hard at work at the Preacher movie. And I saw a, what was it, makeup test that showed arse face, and it looked incredibly comic accurate, and yet also not laughably bad. It didn't look like just a mask. And we were all really hyped about it, and then it just disappeared. That's that's the case when it comes to a lot of these projects. You'll hear a lot of Kevin Smith announcements that never go anywhere. I remember when Kevin Smith announced that he was going to build a View Askew-themed mini-golf course. Ask him about that sometime. But the fact is, one of his moves, and by association, some of these Hollywood types' moves, is to put things out into the zeitgeist and get people excited about it, to prove to their upper management people, to the money people, that there is a demand for it. That rather than try and whip up a deal and then announce to the audience, ladies and gentlemen, we just worked out this six-month-long deal, and I hope you're excited for it because it took a lot of time, money, and effort to develop. Rather, it costs nothing to say, I'm doing this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this movie, I'm going to make this show, I'm going to make this theme park, and then gauge audience reaction, and then take that reaction. Now, if there's no reaction from the audience, you know that you're just going to ignore it and pretend like you never said that. But if there's a huge reaction, you take that reaction and you bring it to your money people, your betters, and you go, hey, there's a reaction for this. And that gets more in your favor, because you now have something that they should want to invest in. So it's a brilliant scheme. 
Now, in the case of Mark Stephen Johnson's Preacher show, he wanted to develop it as a HBO series because back then, back in like 2007, that's all you had. And the clout of HBO was still strong. People were still remembering shows like Oz and The Sopranos. And so Mark Stephen Johnson was like, I want to make this Preacher show. And his pitch, I remember vividly him saying that the pitch was issue one, episode one, issue two, episode two, just slap each issue onto the desk of the people at HBO. And the head of HBO at the time was like, let's do it. This sounds great. It won a bunch of awards. People are excited about it. I remember when James Marsden, star of Westworld, X-Men, and of course Sonic the Hedgehog, uh, he was in talks, or at the very least, he was very interested in playing Jesse Custer, and we were all pretty hyped about it, despite the fact that Mark Stephen Johnson's Ghost Rider is not a good movie, and not the direction I would want Preacher to go in, but hey, listen, dude really wanted to make a Western, clearly he knows at least something about it, because I will never forget Seeing Ghost Rider in the theaters and seeing that huge screen with Sam Elliott on the horse against Monument Valley and just thinking, man, that's a very impressive shot. It was just a really cool moment in an otherwise really not cool movie. But uh, the point of that story is it was in development, at least pre-production, and the new head of HBO came in and just unceremoniously threw out everything the previous administration had on the docket. If there was an idea that the previous head liked, the new head hated it and threw it away and wanted something of their own. This is something that they do all the time, and it's something that people shouldn't blame them for, according to my friends and colleagues, because they need to make a name for themselves, and they don't want to be the people who... I don't know, made their bones off of the backs of the previous administration. They want to show and justify their ascension to this role by making really strong decisions that are original and their own. So that was the death of the Preacher show, and that may be the result of the death of the Green Lantern show, or at the very least the reshuffling of it. Now, you may see something a little different in today's world versus 2007, because I think... They're hurting for money. And I mean, that's no secret. But if they're hurting for money, and they've already invested a whole bunch of money into a Green Lantern show, that means there's concept art. That means that there were strong decisions being made about casting and about direction and about production and about set design and location scouting and all that stuff. If they want to save some money, they could repurpose a lot of that Green Lantern show stuff and shove it into a Green Lantern movie or a realigned Green Lantern show but apparently, according to this, they're refocusing and they want to focus more on Jon Stewart. Strong idea. Makes sense to me. Jon Stewart is most people's favorite Green Lantern thanks to, really, the Justice League animated series, which normalized Jon Stewart. But it didn't hurt that a Green Lantern movie came out starring Hal Jordan and it sucked and nobody liked it. So this will be another palate cleanser for people. Unfortunately, for in my opinion, I feel like it's going to confuse people because if you ignore Hal Jordan, then you're basically just allowing for the reality of that Hal Jordan movie to still be in continuity. You know, if you don't see Hal Jordan, then you assume that it's Ryan Reynolds. I, I, I would not make that assumption, but I think a lot of people would. So I think that's some concern, but I'm sure they're not concerned about it. But that's another thing that was interesting. I was like, oh, in the wake of the James Gunn Ascension Apparently, they're also going to throw out that Green Lantern show, and they're not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. They're going to re-adapt it into something more aligned with, I think, their goals and values and their plans, which is to create a movie empire. According to The Direct, not The Hollywood Reporter, Zaslav needs to save $3 billion. So, canceling this project may have made a lot of sense to at least lighten their load a little bit. And finally, because it's my show, I will wrap up by talking about a release that's coming out on November 2nd on New Comic Book Day, and that is Quick Stops from Kevin Smith and Dark Horse Comics. This is an idea that I had years ago that I thought if I ever had a chance, an audience with Kevin Smith, I'd be like, dude, you made your bones on creating a cinematic universe of serialized stories featuring a cast of characters who all know each other or at the very least live in the same sphere. This is a comic book series, and 
you probably can't get away with making a clerk's book and a mole rat's book and a chasing Amy book, but you can do a view a universe book. Sure enough, here it is. I remember hearing about him announcing it a couple of months ago, if not a year ago. So this is not news to me, but it is news that it's finally coming out. According to this, it's going to tell a story about how Holden met uh, Jay and Silent Bob to begin with. Uh, apparently, there's going to be black and white books uh, or stories uh, and more Jay and Silent Bob adventures. Apparently, it contains references to Clerks, Dogma, Chasing Amy, Mallrats, and Jay and Silent Bob reboot. Great. Uh, honestly, I love this idea and I desperately want to be involved in it in some way because as a Jersey native... I always felt a kinship with not just Kevin Smith, but Kevin Smith's stories and characters, particularly from the View Askew Universe stories. Uh, back then, it was a trilogy, but then it became a quadrilogy, and then a quintrilogy, and now it's just a saga. So, I've always felt a kinship with those characters, because I am a bearded, disaffected, sarcastic guy from New Jersey. I also have a predilection for writing, and I would love to tell a story in the View Askew Universe itself, just to say, I got to tell a story that may or may not involve Dante, Randall, Brody, Holden, hell, uh, why not Bethany Sloan? But this is a great opportunity, I think, for Kev to get some of these other ideas, these littler ideas, out, and maybe showcase some talent that he could curate. Like, this, through Dark Horse, could be a terrific publishing initiative for Smith to develop a slew of books, or at the very least, stories, that could also feature talent that he himself curates. And that's kind of awesome. The idea of being like, I have this following, I have this body of work, and I have an eye for quality, or at the very least, I have an eye for talent. Uh, in the earlier days, I remember he solicited, he found these people. I remember uh, Vincent Pereira, who made A Better Place, Malcolm Ingram, who made Drawing Flies. Like, I don't really like either of those movies, but they you, you can't deny that they have the spirit and tone of that time and that kind of world. Like, View Askew Productions making a movie like Drawing Flies, A Better Place, and Clerks makes perfect sense to me. And not in a derisive, condescending way. I mean, it makes perfect sense to me. These are the kinds of independent movies that they're interested in making. And I think in comics, there's a great opportunity to continue to do that too. Right now, all you have are like clicks in the comic book world. You know, you got a creator and then you got another creator who maybe either was mentored or friends with that creator and then those two creators have a couple of other creator friends that they've made in their circles, and then you've got a, a little group. But you don't have, like, a publishing house. You don't have a production team. You know, the closest thing we're seeing to that in comics right now is Substack, honestly. You look at uh, KLC Press, what Ryan Stegman and Donny Cates are doing over there with Vanish, and how Stegman really would like to develop a kind of Wildstorm Studios idea of a production team, a group of people who are all producing books or stories, or whatever, under that banner. And I don't blame him, because it's a really attractive prospect. Honestly, a, a, as a person with a studio, and with a body of work themselves, it is a little attractive to imagine that we get, like, a couple of other like-minded people into the studio and say, all right, here's the equipment, go make your thing. You know, and we're affiliated with each other in a loose kind of sense. The thing is, the reason we don't do it, and the reason I don't necessarily recommend it, outside of this Kevin Smith Quick Stops initiative, is because of my time with webcomics. I used to love and produce webcomics, and as a result, I was very keyed into that world and those players. Daniel Corsetto, Scott Kurtz, the Penny Arcade team, Tim Buckley, all these different people. And following along with that, you get a lot of interesting insights into how that worked. If you follow Penny Arcade, you know that in the earlier days of their YouTube channel and their productions, you know, maybe even in the early days of PAX, their gaming conventions, they brought in Scott Kurtz of PvP because they were colleagues and eventually friends, and they were all based in Seattle or in the Seattle area, so Scott eventually ended up subletting an office from them, and because he was there, 
they would work together and they would bounce ideas off each other, even though they were two separate independent studios. But then the lines got blurred because like Scott became Binwin Bronzebottom and joined Acquisition Incorporated. And the, the, and I think that the lines got blurred for all of them, particularly Scott, because of how closely they worked together and how Scott then had access to resources that Penny Arcade had. I cite Robert Koo, the Uber producer for them, who I don't know what he's doing now, but I imagine whatever he's doing is successful. At least I would hope. But of course, Scott had his own people. He brought in Chris Straub. And so now Chris was part of the team, so to speak, or this this blurred kind of community that all subsisted under the Penny Arcade umbrella, but also were wholly separate and their own thing. So you can imagine it got really confusing. And if you know the end of this story, you know why I'm kind of like not interested in doing that. And hell, my own story is a little bit of a lesson learned in that regard. But if you look at the story of Penny Arcade and, and, and PVP slash Scott Kurtz, you know that it doesn't end well. That Scott no longer associates with not only Penny Arcade, but also Chris Straub. Those guys don't talk. They're not friends. They were not just friends, but business partners in a sense. And now, totally separate entities. And it's entirely, I think, due to the blurred lines between their associations and companies. Because it went from, I'm over here, I make this, you're over there, you make that. If we meet in the middle, it's because we both agreed to meet in the middle. And if we're going to make something in the middle, we got to work that out and make a contract and make that formal. If you're in the same room or the same building and you can just yell over your shoulder or if you all get together and have dinner and lunch together and your wives are friends and all that stuff, it gets a lot more complicated. And that's something you want to avoid, especially if you're trying to build a brand or a company, is getting people confused with you and arguably your competitor. But I am excited for Quick Stops and I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes. But listen, you're probably pulling into your job right now, so I want to leave you here. I want to thank you so much for listening. Of course, check out youtube.com slash comic pop and comic pop returns. And if you like the show, let me know. We'll see what we do. But this was fun. I'm glad I got a chance to come along with you on your commute to work. And I hope you have an awesome day. Stay well, keep reading, and I'll see you next time. (laughs) 